universal basic income is an idea that's older than America, where Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country, called it the citizen's dividend. Decades later, Martin Luther King Jr. was for it, and he championed it before he was assassinated in 1968. And Milton Friedman and a thousand economists signed the studies in the late 60s saying this would be tremendous for both the economy and society. It received so much support that it passed the House of Representatives twice under Richard Nixon in 1971. And the only reason it didn't become law was that Democrats in the Senate wanted an even higher income threshold. So a universal basic income has been with this country for a long time. And it actually became law in one state in 1982 where now every person in Alaska gets between one and two thousand dollars a year no questions asked from a petroleum dividend. It's wildly popular, has created thousands of jobs, has improved children's health, has decreased income inequality, and it was passed by a Republican governor who made this argument to the Alaskan people. Who would you rather get the oil money? The government who's just going to mess it up or you? And the Alaskan people said us and now it's so popular that a majority of Alaskans which is a deeply conservative state generally, the majority of Alaskans said they would accept higher taxes to pay for this dividend moving forward. My plan, the Freedom Dividend, would pay every American adult starting at age 18 $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year. This would push every American adult to just below the poverty line, which is $12,770 a year right now. But this money would get spent in Main Street businesses, on car repairs, food and tutoring for your kids, the occasional night out, a hardware store, it would go right back into our economy and would create two million new jobs, would grow the consumer economy by eight to ten percent, would make our families and communities stronger, would improve children's health and nutrition, would improve everyone's mental health and productivity, it would decrease domestic violence uh, and hospital visits. So universal basic income is a, a powerful policy that helps improve human welfare and that's uh, why I'm proposing the it. The Labor Department is out with the jaw-dropping new numbers. Unemployment claims skyrocketing with 6.6 .6 million people filing in the last week alone. It's still 1.5 million. It's still an enormous number. One of the clearly worst parts of what's happened over the last couple of months is this taken a much worse toll on the African-American community. I feel sad because I can't provide for my kids like I normally would. You're uncertain about today or tomorrow. Tomorrow, you're just living moment to moment. Salcido had to lay off her all Latino staff. It's time to say goodbye to Barrio Cafe Grand Reserve. They do the jobs that other people don't want to do. I'm ready to go back. I need to go back. Wall Street is set to open up higher. And the Nasdaq set a record and passed the 10,000 mark. What a tear stocks have been on. There's a huge disconnect. You got 30 million people out of work in the stock market, and the Nasdaq is at record highs. Okay. Together we built the greatest economy in history, and now we have to bring it back. We still have a lot of hardship, but it looks like we've hit a turning point. More than 30% of Americans have not made their full housing payments for July, including 19% who made no housing payments at all. A nation in crisis and rapidly reaching an economic turning point. Americans started this year working. Our unemployment rate was at a 50-year low. Yet somewhere between half and three quarters of all Americans were living paycheck to paycheck. And that was before the pandemic, before the country shut down and put tens of millions of people out of work. I think that there is an emerging consensus that the economy, amongst voters, that the economy is not working for most Americans. So when the country was founded in the 18th century, it its framers subscribe to an idea that progress is moral. And that idea of progress came from Christianity, that pilgrim's progress is a journey from sin to salvation. Enlightenment philosophers, like the guys who drafted the founding documents of the United States, didn't share that, necessarily share that particular Christian notion of, of a journey from sin to salvation, but they understood progress. And the United States and its founding as an experiment would lead to political progress because it would was designed to improve the lives of the most people, that people would act with, in a sense of a common endeavor as a republic, that our obligations would be to one another in a form of community, and that we should understand achievement as moral progress. That changed over the course of the 19th century when progress came to have a real technological cast. If you think about the railroad, the telegraph, uh, the camera, people began to think about progress as advancing like a train on a, a linear track 
and each machine would make the world better because things would go faster and goods would become cheaper. And very quickly, that idea of moral progress was replaced by progress as prosperity. So by the 1980s, there's such a kind of reckless heedlessness in American businesses. Uh, and it's the kind of the great, the sort of mergers age, the kind of like a Wall Street grubbiness, that kind of like that Michael Douglas movie moment, right? Like the greed is good kind of thing. That innovation, this innovation, heedless innovation is fine because this is how this creative destruction is, you know, this shumpter term that gets recycled. This is the engine of economic growth. And nothing else matters. The public good, uh, moral integrity, decency, goodness for more people, the health of the republic, all that matters is, is it innovative? Is it, is it, is, and then by the 1990s, is it disruptively innovative? Which is even more radically innovative, that it, that it, that it disrupts existing models of, of business and disrupts existing industries. And so you get this real embrace of heedlessness as an American value or as a corporate value, um, which is a complete abdication of the spirit of progress, right? And, and it also, it's also designed, the whole ideology, it really is like a religion. It's very culty, uh, the idea of disruptive innovation. It's designed to refute its own critics, it's designed to refuse critics, because among its principles is that the past doesn't matter. No one should ever study history or care about the past, because if you're gonna be a disruptive innovator, if all that matters is novelty, you don't want to know, if you're going to you know, invent a new ride service, you shouldn't study taxi dispatch because it will interfere with the creative destruction that you're capable of and it will limit your vision and it will make your disruptive innovation insufficiently innovative and insufficiently disruptive. So you have to abdicate the past. There is no concern with the past. People want to criticize you for failing. Oh no, failure is actually a virtue of disruptive innovation. It's a, it's a very self-contained explanation that in my view, introduces an extraordinary amount of disequilibrium into a political system that is a republic, that is actually designed on the idea that in, in many ways, the businesses have to have the public interest at heart because the government is protecting their, their capacity to do business by creating civil order and safety for the transportation of goods. And government provides all kinds of services that make it possible for businesses to thrive. Therefore, businesses too have to be concerned with a healthy social and political order, with you know, avoiding wild inequalities of wealth and income, with avoiding wild political turbulence. But disruptive innovation isn't concerned with any of those things. Disruptive innovation is concerned with blowing things up. If you lose your job in a city in this country, uh, it's probably as or more likely that the reason you're losing your job is not globalization, but it's technology-enabled disruption. Okay, it's, things are, it's changing. People are attributing it to globalization, but it's probably as or more likely to be due to the fact that businesses are increasingly replacing workers with technology. Whole industries are being disrupted. Hello everyone, I'm a sorting robot. I know I look cute, but my skills are a lot more impressive. I can identify the information on each of the parcels effectively and sort them out precisely. My friends and I can process as many as 18,000 parcels in an hour. Why should we be worried about automation? Well, if you look at the backdrop, we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, and those communities have never recovered. Where if you look at the numbers, half of the workers left the workforce and never worked again, and then half of that group filed for disability. Now, what happened to the manufacturing workers is now going to happen to the truck drivers, retail workers, call centers, fast food workers, and on and on through the economy as we evolve and technology marginalizes the labor of more and more Americans. I think it's going to be disastrous, where if you look at truck drivers alone, being a trucker is the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truck drivers in this country. Uh, and my friends in Silicon Valley are working on trucks that can drive themselves because that's where the money is, where we can save tens, even hundreds of billions of dollars by trying to automate that job. Uh, workers are far more likely today to lose their jobs or have their functions changed because of technology-enabled disruption. Technology is replacing people. And in addition, 
because of technology-enabled disruption, consumers have much more uh, pricing power. They have the ability to shop with technology. That's putting much more pressure on businesses in terms of pricing pressure, and businesses don't have as much pricing power, and that probably is rippling back through impacts on workers and their wages, uh, and may be encouraging businesses to increasingly replace workers with technology. Oftentimes the UBI is talked about, these days at least, in the context of the rise of the robots and pending technical unemployment, as a lot of people um, call it. And my view is that very well may happen. There's also a good argument by a lot of economists and other folks at this time is not different. What we know is that the future is already here and work and jobs in America have already come apart. When the coronavirus hit the U.S. economy, it came fast and furious. There's the circuit breaker, oh, uh, 25, 49, 48, and, and the bell. The nation went into a panic, stocking up and shocking our supply chain. As millions began working and teaching from home, our skies and airports emptied out. Normal life canceled as millions of businesses, big and small, closed, pushing us into the worst global recession in history. Roughly 50 million unemployment claims filed in the span of just four months. I mean, of all the jobs, nearly all the jobs that we've created in the past decade have been part-time, contingent, or temporary. These kinds of very unstable, lumpy, uh, jobs with lumpy income cycles. And a guaranteed income of $500 a month would be a powerful force to stabilize the lives of people who who need it the most. In some ways, it's a down payment. If the robots do indeed rise and self-driving cars are on the roads in five years, as some technologists predict, then it'd be much easier to build on a foundation of a guaranteed income of something like $500 a month than to begin afresh. So my view is that the idea of a guaranteed income is to solve the problems of today and in a way that it could be implemented immediately. I've worked on cash, and specifically using cash as a tool for economic mobility for several years now, first internationally and then domestically. And the thing about it is it asks fundamental questions about trust. If you give people money, can you trust them to make the decisions that are best for them? You know, will they use it responsibly or irresponsibly? And I think there's a sense, particularly in American culture, that's, um, that is pervasive uh, of concern. That, you know, if you're going to give this money to young men, they're just going to put up their feet and play video games. Or there's this pervasive myth of the welfare queen that, you know, there are people who just want to, you know, stay home and live on, on government benefits. And I think the challenge for those of us who believe that those are very much myths is to amplify the stories uh, that the kind of stories that I hear nearly every day. Universal basic income is a, a brilliant idea, especially in view of the failures of the welfare state. If you look at the welfare state now, it has grown into a kind of securitized, weaponized system against the poor. It is a system for humiliating the poor, for putting them through various hoops to prove that they are deserving poor. Uh, it's a very expensive system, both in terms of the emotional effect that it has on the people that have to prove that they deserve benefits, and also in terms of the, the, the actual economics of it. Uh, so the idea that everybody should have an income, uh, independently of how, whether they're rich or poor, that comes from the collective. Uh, and then th that can be the basis for them to um, unfold their talents and their creativity without having to do demeaning work. This is a great idea. The question is, where is this income going to come from? What I know as a, an economist that has worked all over the world, including in the poorest places in the world, little bits can save lives and make futures for the children of this world at unbelievably low cost and it just uh, gets me that we have 10 trillion dollars here and we have kids who are hungry dying and out of school over here it's mind-boggling mind-boggling to think of jeff bezos for example with a net worth personally individual net worth of 
hold on to your chair, how about $163 billion? That's, that's a lot of money. It's, uh, I'm, I'm myself a, an Amazon user. Uh, I think it's an awfully good uh, uh, service and product that he's developed. But $163 billion in a world where a lot of his workers struggle to get by. A lot of the people in Seattle where uh, Amazon is headquartered are homeless, where there are incredible needs that for a tiny fraction of that wealth could keep millions of kids alive and in school. You have to say, all right, world economy is dynamic, but it's not really exactly fair and it's not really oriented towards uh, addressing everyone's uh, basic human rights and needs. And can't we make the connection? And the answer is we have to. So my thought is at a minimum, 10 trillion, come on, put in at least 1%, that's such a tiny amount because your wealth grows at much more than that. Put in 1% of your net worth per year minimum to help the kids. 1% of 10 trillion is $100 billion. And if you take out your paper and pencil or your Excel spreadsheet, you can show that for $100 billion a year, 1% of the net worth of just 2,208 individuals, you could get every kid in school all the way through upper secondary education, and you could establish universal health coverage for everybody in every low-income country in the world. Now, that's a pretty good gig for 2,208 people, but they got to get on with it. I think they have enough yachts, enough mansions, enough of everything, and it's really time for that wealth to be deployed for the purposes of our generation of children who utterly and desperately need it. And I say, do it voluntarily, or if you don't do it voluntarily, fine, we'll put on a levy. So the way I propose to pay for a universal basic income uh, is based on a problem we have right now in our country, which is that more and more work and value is getting sucked up and soaked up by a handful of technology companies. Uh, Amazon, for example, is doing another $20 billion in commerce every year, and it's now pushing 30% of American malls and Main Street stores into closing. And so for the average uh, American, you're seeing your Main Street stores close, and unfortunately, being a retail worker is the most common job in the United States. The average retail worker is a 39-year-old woman making between $11 and $12 an hour. So the problem America is facing is that even as, as Amazon's soaking up more and more value, they're not paying much in the way of taxes. You probably saw the headline where last year Amazon enjoyed record profits and paid zero in federal taxes. And so the way we pay for a universal basic income is we put the American people in position to benefit from all this innovation by passing a value-added tax, which is something that's already in effect in every other advanced economy. With a value-added tax, the American public would receive a sliver of every Amazon sale, every Google search, every Facebook ad, every robot truck mile. And because our economy is now so vast at $20 trillion, up $5 trillion in the last 12 years alone, a value-added tax at even half the European level would generate $800 billion in revenue, which combined with current spending, economic growth and putting this buying power into Americans' hands, cost savings on things like incarceration, homelessness services, and emergency room health care, and then the value gains from having a stronger, more educated, more productive, more entrepreneurial population. There's one study that showed that if you were to reduce, uh, reduce poverty in this country, you would actually be increasing GDP by $700 billion just by making people stronger, healthier, better educated, and uh, mentally healthier. And so we're going to be able to pay for this universal basic income if we put in a new tax that harnesses the gains of all these new technological innovations and brings them back to the American people. I personally don't believe it should come from taxation. And it shouldn't come from taxation for a number of reasons, one of them being political. If you take, for instance, a blue-collar worker that struggles uh, all day in a factory or on a shop floor or working for Amazon, whatever, uh, and you tell him, usually him, could be a her, 
that um, another person will be sitting on the, on the couch watching television being supported by the state to do this. You are creating a huge political clash there within the working class. So I'm against that. But if you say to the, to the population, independently of which social class they belong to, that these days capital is socially produced. Capital. Capital goods. Take, for instance, the stock, the capital stock of Google. To a large extent, it is produced by all of us. Every time we search something on the Google search engine, we are adding to the capital stock of Google. This is not just a consumer um, transaction. So if capital is socially produced, why are the returns to capital privatized? <laughs> on what basis? To cut a long story short, my proposal has been for a number of years now, what we call a universal basic dividend. So I believe that a percentage of all shares, shares of all companies, should go into a public equity trust, like a, a wealth fund for society, and the dividends should be distributed uh, to every member of society equally. So a universal basic income, but the income comes from returns to capital, not from taxation. When the rubber meets the road, there are really big questions about who pays for this. And um, there's, I'm sure, lots of skepticism that tax rates should go up. I think ultimately, though, the, the, the case can be made that this is not just a moral issue that everybody should have basic financial stability, but also a practical one. And if we really want the economy to continue to grow and not face the kind of depression which happened right after 1929, the year that inequality was last as bad as it is now, then we're going to have to think about creative ideas that break through like this. So my hope is that particularly the earned income tax credit, which has been expanded by every president since Gerald Ford, Republican and Democrat alike, can be a framework for at least bipartisan dialogue, if not consensus, on a way to reboot the American dream and make sure that people have uh, the economic opportunity that they want and deserve. As a voter in the United States, I would ask our candidates to, uh, to, to actually acknowledge and provide proposals that are realistic about how they are going to take care of workers and the middle class in the midst of these massive economic transformations that are aided by private corporate run technology um, that we're witnessing all around us. I would ask our candidates again in the United States election to explain to us how they are going to maintain economic security in a country that becomes more and more economically unequal, how they are going to ensure that technological transitions are ones that benefit all of us and how they can introduce work of the future where the digital economy actually works for everybody. And more than anything, we need to pressure our companies that are making labor and work obsolete in the interests of innovation. It's innovation for whom is really the question. We have to ask them for all the jobs, for all the economic security you take away, you need to provide us with something too. And here are all these different possibilities we can engage with from you know, thinking about universal basic income ideas, to worker-owned cooperative ideas, to regulatory ideas, to competitive market ideas. There is a lot out there. And I ask us all to, to maintain a little bit of optimism, but push. You know, we got to push on all fronts. Uh, we are at an inflection point when it comes to top-down control over very many different aspects of our lives through privatized corporate power over technology. We can work with these guys and try to push them to make sure that they restore balance in our lives. Get smarter faster with new videos daily at 5 a.m. Eastern.